and, uh, and welcome everybody. Okay. We've been giving out we have so many newcomers that we're almost finished our notebooks. But if there is anyone else that's new, Shala, you, you've been here obviously, but you but you hardly come to classes, so you're kind of welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. Are you still thinking about notebooks? You get out. Notebook. Okay, so are we ready to start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. We're recording? Yeah, we're recording. Okay, cool. Lost our internet connection for a minute. I'm. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's not. It's like lunch and it's going to be a long day for me. So, okay, so we're continuing and almost coming to the end of a series that we've been doing for the last probably two, two months or so, two months or more on Jewish women and trying to understand their stories so we can pull out their character traits, okay? Because this is a course on, it's called Between You and Me. It's um, interpersonal relationships, character building, growth, uh, Musar, which is uh, translated as rebuke, like ways that we could better ourselves. So what we're doing right now, and we're almost at the end of the series, is speaking about some of the stories of the women that have come before us and trying to glean from their stories who they are, what their gift was, and how we could po possibly tap into some of their, their, you know, their traits, their gift, and make it a part of us. So we are going to do two women today. We're going to attempt to learn about two women, two famous women more famous than some of the others that we've been doing in the past when I've been saying like, who knows who Yael is? And like not one person raises their hands. So let's just raise hands if you know the story of Ruth and Naomi. Okay, so about half the room. And none of you, not familiar? You have, you have a daughter, Naomi, right? So, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna delve into the story. Um, Sue, sometimes you're my note keeper. I want you to, once again, when we speak it through, if there's something that comes up that's a character trait, that you see a certain strength, just jot it down. Let's try to keep track of what their essence was, what their gifts were, so that maybe we could think about it in our own lives. Okay, so we're going to start from the very, very beginning of the story. The story actually starts with Naomi, and then comes Ruth. Okay, this is a mother, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law duo. It's the only of its kind that we learn about in the Torah. And whatever you've heard about or experienced with your own mother-in-laws and you know, daughter-in-laws, but whoever, wherever you're sitting here in this room, there's a, a, a wide variety of ages and stages over here. So some of you are the daughter-in-law, some of you are the mother-in-law. And very often the relationship is known to be like, what is the stereotypical relationship? Strained, right? Like, you know, like there's even songs written about it. I remember like the candle lighting ceremony at like my brother's bar mitzvah. It was like, mother-in-law, mother-in-law. Do you guys know the song? No? No? Okay. There are songs written about it, but it's, we joke. There are many jokes about this relationship. So, and so Sue is shaking her head. You, you have a very good relationship with your... You're talking about your son's. No, my mother-in-law. Oh, your mother-in-law. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. That's so nice. So you're the exception to the rule, and so is and so is Ruth and Naomi. Okay, but for all of us that are in that relationship, whichever side of the relationship you're on, I want you to take note because I think that this story is written down to teach us what the ideal relationship is supposed to be like because this one is ex exemplary. Is that the word? Did I say it right? Yeah. Exemplary, okay? It's like the model, the paradigm of a great mother-daughter-in-law relationship. Okay, so we're gonna first start with Naomi, who is born a Jew. She's born into a prestigious life. She marries into wealth. She has, you know, you, you would think that everything is going to be peaches and rainbows and unicorns for her whole life. But we know that that's not always how it goes, right? So, you know, we, there's a saying in Hebrew that says, Yeshua Hashem keheref ayin, which means that the salvation of God could come in a blink of an eye. 
Meaning, and that's a very positive way of saying everything could shift, everything could change, right? One day things are going amazingly well and the next day something changes and your whole situation is different. So it could go in both ways. We hope it'll go always in, in a good way, but over here in her situation, unfortunately, it goes from, from being like, she is at the prime of her life, married to a wealthy, prestigious man with her sons and with, with just everything she, she could want and hope for. And she, she takes things turn and she goes into a very, very dark place. So her story actually is like this. She, um, a famine starts in the land. Okay, and, and we've been hearing this again and again in different stories, in different parts of our Jewish history. You know, when the Jews went down to Egypt, it was because there was famine, there was no food. So it's, and we spoke also about how every 70 to 80 years of our history, like we get really comfortable and we forget that there's a God in the world. We think that it's our strength and our might and our power that's making us successful. And when we forget God, he reminds us. So we see over here, this is kind of a case of things are going so, so well that they forget that their wealth is a gift to be used and utilized for good. So when the famine happens in Israel, they're living in a, in a, the, a place called Beit Lechem, which should sound familiar to many people. Does, does Beit Lechem sound familiar? One of our matriarchs is buried there, right? Keva Rachel is on the way to Beit Lechem. So that's, we hear it a lot in the Torah. So they're living in this land in Israel in Beit Lechem. There's a terrible famine. And because Avimelech, Naomi's husband, was the wealthy man, the judge, the leader, he was in such a place of prestige. He actually, he, he, he's not his best self over here. And because he can't take all the knocking on the door and saying, please, could you help me? Please, can you feed me? Please, can you donate to me again and again and again? Because there was such a great need in his land. And he was the one that people turned to. So in a weak moment, he says, let's pick up our things. Let's take our wealth and let's leave. And they go to the land of Moab. And this is a very big turning point for this family who really has everything and they have the opportunity to be on the giving end and not on, you know how hard it is to be on the receiving end? These people knocking on their door, you know how much confidence it takes to make that knock, to take a hand out, but they were so desperate and he had the ability to give, but instead he turned inwards, he turned to his selfish ways, he made a huge mistake and they go to a far off land in um, Moab, which is not a Jewish neighborhood. No one's gonna bother him there. No one's gonna be knocking on his door. He's not gonna need to share his wealth. But that one choice that he makes, clearly God punishes him for his bad decision and he loses all his wealth. He, he actually dies and all of his sons die. In a very short time, they go from one tragedy to the next, to the next, to the next. So we're starting this story of Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And there was actually another daughter-in-law. Do you know the name? Oh, oh good. Orpa. Okay. Those were two uh, Mo Moavite women. Okay. Two women from Moab. So they're not Jewish that married their sons. When they moved down there, they opened themselves up to intermarrying their family into the land that they settled in. So all their sons marry Moavite women. And just tragedy keeps befalling. The tragedy has nothing to do with the women. The women are good women. They're, 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 they're good Gentile women. There's nothing written terrible about them. The, there is some commentary about why the men died. They actually died without any children. And I'm not going to get into it, but there is some conversation how they didn't want their wives to become not beautiful. So they wouldn't allow their wives to get pregnant. So they would spill their seed and which is not a Jewish thing. Like we're very pro, you know, having children, you know, that's, that's a mitzvah for a man to have a child, but they didn't want to have children. So they, they, they clearly like these, these men had their own shtick, their own things that they were going through and doing that was not acceptable. And the women were, they, they really didn't have a choice in the matter. So here we have, Mother Naomi 
two daughter-in-laws completely bereft, exhausted, there's no money, there's, there's no providers, they're in this faraway land. Naomi doesn't even have the support of her community. She's all alone, okay? So things just went from, from bad to, to worse. Okay, so at this time, Naomi begs her daughter-in-laws to go back to their life, to their land, to, they're in their lands already, go back to your parents' home, start again. You know, you, you guys are young, you could remarry. By the way, they were both Moabite princesses. So they come from prestige. They come from wealth. They had, they had a beautiful life. You could go back to your parents' palace. You could have your own amazing, you know, wealthy existence. And, and, and they don't want to leave. They love their mother-in-law so much. Clearly, Naomi was an exceptional woman. And they don't want to leave her. So she says again and again and again, you should really go back. And we see that how many times, does anyone know how many times, or if anyone is here in this room, a Jew by choice, or, or, or is connected to someone that has converted to Judaism, customarily, it's not always the case, okay, but you are all right, a few of you said three times, there's a Jewish tradition, because we don't proselytize, we're not out there saying, you know, we're not dropping books in people's uh, mailbox saying, you know, God, and come, and, you know, Christ will save you, like, we're not, we're not, we don't go out and do that. Many religions do. We don't. But anyone could convert to the Jewish people. We're not elitists. We're not like, no, you, you're you, anyone from any nation could become a Jew. But the tradition is that at first, when they approach you, you say, do you really want to? Do you know our history? Do you know how persecuted we've been? Like, <laughs> you want to get your head checked before doing this? You kind of like, put it out there that it's not always so easy. Do you know that we have 613 laws in the Torah? Like, do you even know what you're getting yourself into? I have, I've, I've told you guys this, my, probably my favorite work that I've done in my life is working with people that have become Jewish. And, and at first I, I do tell them like, are you sure you want to even start? Or maybe start on a very low level and you no, know, let's see if it's still something that you want to talk about in a, in a couple of weeks. Let's take it real slow because it's not for everyone. And thank God I've been able to help probably between five and 10 people become full-fledged Jews in different, in my community in Denver, in Portland, and in Chicago, I'm just trying to think if I'm, yeah, I haven't yet had the, the merit of, of helping someone yet, but you know, I'm open for business. So <laughs> you know, we'll see, I'm just putting it out there, sends it out to the world. But um, it's such a beautiful thing, but but from those like five, 10 people, I mean, each one is, has a beautiful flourishing family. It's each person is a world, right? The Talmud tells us that if you save one, one Jew, you save a world. Well, it's the same. If you bring one person into the Jewish world, they're going to have generations and generations. So it's, it's a really special thing. But I have to say that there's only a few people that have made it all the way to that point. There have been dozens of people that have started learning towards becoming a Jew with them. And I'm not going to take it personally, but they have turned their backs at a certain point and said, you know what? It's not for me. And I totally, totally respect that. And the truth is, if I found out today that I was not Jewish, I think it would be a big decision. Not really. Not really. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it'd be like, okay, what do I need to do? I'll immerse in the mikvah, like I'm all in. But I have to say, it's not, it's not so simple to go from being a good, righteous Gentile that has seven mitzvot b'nei Noach, seven Noahite laws, and you are good as gold. That's all you have to do. To going to being a Jew that I'm telling you, I try so hard to be a good Jew. I try to observe every single one of the laws that I could. I mean, you can't do them all. Some are in Israel, some are when you're, you know, there's different scenarios. You can't do them all. So there's maybe 270 mitzvot that I could do. It's still a lot, right, Bonnie? It's still, it's a lot and it's heavy and it's sometimes it feels. Yeah. It depends. I mean, there's different ways of coming into the Jewish world. I, there's not only one door. There are many ways in. So good question. And I guess it's a personal, you know, it depends how people want to come in. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, so I'm just saying 
hard decision that I don't know if we would all think it's something to think about at home or to bring it up at your table. If you found out tomorrow that you weren't Jewish, would you just be happy with being a really good, regular person? Or would you want to jump through hoops of fire, which basically that's what it feels like to me. There was one time that I was with my dear friend, her name is Melanie Avner. She lives in Denver and we were, we've been friends for many years. She's one of the first people I met when I moved there and she was going through a conversion and she asked me to help her and to walk by her side. And at some point it was so hard that I remember saying to her, she came over and she was crying and I was crying. And I remember holding her hand and saying, I don't think I'd have the strength to do what you're doing. And I really, really meant it. It really, really felt like this is hard. This is hard stuff. And that's why it's so meaningful. When you do something really hard, it's something that you own it. If it was so easy, you know, everyone would do it. So, okay, so we, we see here. So this is the first story in a way, the first big story that in the Torah where we speak, this is really where we get a lot of the laws about converting to Judaism. We, we learn it from this story of Ruth. Because in this moment, we have these two women and she's saying, go back, go back to your parents, have a nice life, start again, you guys are young. And at this point, we have Orpa that says, you know what, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna start again, I'm gonna go back to my childhood. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay a nice, you know, non-Jew. And that's totally, totally fine. But Ruth wants to move forward. Okay, and this is a moment that defines forevermore. And if anyone saw, because I just posted it like 20 minutes ago um, on our Between You and Me chat, which if anyone is not on and you want to get on, it's where we post and share things about this class. So I put a picture of a long staircase, spiral staircase, and it says that, and it's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. It says, you only need to take the first step. So you basically see this teeny little step, and it's this this defining, like you're at a crossroads in your life, which we could all relate to. Like I could do this or I could do that, but everything will have ramifications forevermore. Mm -hmm. So Orpah goes back. She actually becomes pregnant with, she becomes the foremother of Goliath who fought the Jewish people. Okay. It's so crazy. And Ruth goes forward and we're gonna hear how her story unfolds. And when she eventually gets pregnant, she becomes the foremother of King David, the messianic lineage, the foremother of the Messiah. So we see over here that every choice we make is so crucial. It's just one step and that's all we could do. All we could take is the right little baby step in front of us, but and, and trust that that baby step will lead to the next one and the next one and years pass or decades pass or your life goes by and you look back and you could barely recognize who you've become in a good way when you take the right step that's right in front of you at the time. Okay, so going back, going back to the story, the, the problem we're sharing in this class is that they can't hear. So let's save all the questions and comments for the end, because I know I, we, we, have, we have a lot of people here on, on Zoom. So hold it, hold it, Bonnie, okay? Okay. It was, it was snarky anyways. How do I guess, Bonnie? Okay, okay, love you, love you, love you. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, first of all, there's what, what we see, what I find so beautiful about this story is that there are many times in the story that you see the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-laws at their pivotal moments of choice, they're all weeping, they're hugging, they're weeping, they're so connected. We, we've spoken about how souls could be connected to each other, like the, the Hebrew words in the Torah says, nafsho kashura lenafsho, that souls are tied to each other. Think about some relationships in your life. It could be a friend to a friend relationship. It could be a, a child parent relationship. It could be, there are many different types of relationships in the Torah that have this, we use these words that the souls were really tied to each other. They were so connected and bonded. So over here, you see these three women completely embracing and weeping and crying. And even though Orpah turns back at that moment, there was still, she was in that little circle of weeping and feeling so connected to the other women around her, okay? So, okay. Let's, let's, 
let's 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 take this story a little bit um, further. I'm gonna the famous speech that Ruth gives in this moment of her saying, "I'm not turning back." You could tell me again and again and again, but I want this. I and she's willing to sacrifice because her life right now is very bleak. They don't have money. They don't have. She doesn't have a husband. In those days, it could be a single woman was didn't. I don't know. Hold power. I, I don't know what it was like, but it was it was hard. They they became beggars. It was a humiliating experience. So much so that when they do go together, this mother and daughter-in-law duo back to Israel, back, back to Beit Lechem, they come in and people are like, oh my goodness, is that Naomi? She looks terrible. Like everyone, rumor of going around, like every, everyone's schmoozing and yenting and talking about them because you were like, she left this prestigious woman and she's coming back completely like, you know, she doesn't even look like herself. Okay, and it was very humiliating. They had to become a chesed case. They had a chesed case. Do you know what that means? Like they were like charity. They were a charity case, begging for food, going into the fields because it was during the harvest field that the story happens. And there's actually many laws in the Torah that protects people that are in need. Right, we we know that it's an obligation for all of us to look out to our brethren, to our brothers and sisters that are in need. And Chesed starts at home. If someone in your community is is not does not have an, enough to you know food on the table, it's your responsibility. So the Torah actually has many many laws for harvest season that that protect the poor. That if people are harvesting and sh some of their sheaves drop or in, then you're not allowed to pick up the sheets. You have to leave them there on the ground for people that are coming afterwards to pick them up. The corners of your land are not to be harvested. There are, I think there are three or four special mitzvot that, that give security to people that are poor. And they came back into their hometown having to be the recipients of, of this kindness, this chesed, this charity. So the famous speech. Okay, and this will be familiar to all of you, but it's just, it's so, so beautiful. Um, and it's, and it, before I even say the speech, I just want to say there's a quote in the book, Ethics of the Father of Our Fathers, Pure Kehavod, that says, okay, and we could just translate this, try to understand it. It's better to be the tail of a lion than the head of a fox. What does that mean to you? Okay, it's better to be at the back of something great than the leader of something sly. So that was what Ruth decided in the moment. She'd rather be, she doesn't care if she's gonna have to be the chesed case, but at least she's gonna be part of the Jewish people rather than being this great princess of, of Moab, but not, not being able to, to live her values. Okay, so this is something that she is so clear. She has complete clarity. By the way, Sue, write that down because she is she is stubborn. It's almost like she was born Jewish, her stubbornness. Okay, because that is a Jewish trait. But she's very stubborn. You know, it takes a certain amount of stubbornness to, to say no again and again and again. This is what I want. Really? Is that really what you want? And she's not wavering. She's not wavering. So this is her famous quote. Do not urge me to leave you to turn back for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, your people are my people and your God is my God. Where I die, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus may God do to me and so may he do more if anything but death separates me from you. She's basically, first of all, there are so you could, we could pull this apart and analyze all the different, all the, everything she was saying. There was, these words were not just words. These were heavy words. She's talking about how we live, how we, how we dwell, how we die, all the different parts of being a Jew. It's different. How we live and die is different from the rest of the world, right? The way of Jewish burial is different. She's basically, every word she said was loaded with meaning that I'm all in for every single part of what it means to go with you. I, I get it. I get it. I'm coming with you. And it's this is this very moving statement. Statement. So this was she was really she becomes the first convert to to dislike to I don't know. I'm. It's not the first convert, right? Because we've had 
converts, but she is, it's the first time that we're seeing this devotion, this dedication, um, this coming back again and again. And what does Naomi say to her? What does Naomi say? Does she say, okay? She doesn't say anything because she knows that this is, this is Ruth's journey. There's nothing she could say at this point, even if Naomi would say, don't come with me, Ruth is already on her path. There's no turning back. So she actually, she stays silent and they just head. They head towards Beit Lechem, right? Her plea is clearly fully embraced by her mother-in-law. And these two poor women enter Beit Lechem on foot, no food, no nothing, rags. And their story is really one of rags to riches. But, 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 but to think about it, it started with riches, it went to rags, and it turns back to riches. So it's, it really, I mean, Disney should do something on this. Seriously. It makes it so much more meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. Like they knew what they were giving up. It's not like rags to riches. When you're born into rags, it's all you know. But they gave it up to become, to, and, and they were fine. These two women, they were both, they both came from very wealthy homes and this was their lot. And then of course, things pick up for them and Hashem blesses them and things change. Okay, so let's let's move forward with the storyline. Okay, now we're gonna enter a man on the scene. His name is Boaz, okay? Boaz is um, a wealthy landowner, He's the owner of the fields. He's, it's the time of harvest. So he's in the field 24 seven. He even slept in the field because this was like crunch time. It's like for an accountant, like 24 seven during tax season. So this is his season. And he's also at this time, he's the Jewish leader in Beit Lechem because he was from the same family as Elimelech who left and lost everything. Okay, so they're related. They're somewhat related, and I'm not sure how closely related they are. Okay, so he notices Ruth, because Ruth is this young, beautiful woman. And what does he notice about her, by the way? So here's Sue, here's another thing that we learn about her. There was something very beautiful about her, her personality. It was her modesty. You know, many of the young women would go to the field, and you could just imagine it was like in the fields, like it was like, you know, they're bending over. Her, everything is hanging out, whatever. Like it was like, ooh, who's that in the field? But Ruth had a very different way. She would bend, the way she would bend down was not like leaning over. It was like, she would actually sit on the ground to pick up the sheaves, okay? To pick up the wheat. And she had such a modesty about her that people noticed it. This was very, this was like, she became, she just, it's amazing how clearly this was part of her I don't know who she was, but when she became a Jewish woman, she embodied this modesty of for the matriarch. Sarah was also known to be very modest. So over here we see like her modesty and he's, and he notices her, like she's different to the other women in the fields. Who is this woman? And then he hears the story. She's a Moabite princess who married Elimelech's son. All the sons die. The husband died. This is his cousin, right? And he's, and, and people know, people are gossiping because when they came in impoverished, people were gossiping what happened to them. Everyone was talking about the story. So he knew that she became Jewish and she stood with her mother-in-law. That story spoke volumes to who she was as a human being. And so he actually takes kind of a liking to her, probably in a fatherly way. And he says, you know, why don't you just, just, get your wheat from my fields. You don't need to go to the regular field with all the, like he gives her kind of like a, I don't know, like a bit of a VIP situation as, yeah, preferential treatment. And you know what, come to my field, it's a little there, you're not gonna be harassed by the other, by, by, by some of the, I don't wanna say the word like low lives, but there, it was a hard situation for a single woman to be out there in the field with many people that were, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it sounds very derogatory, but things happened in the fields. So he tried to protect her a little bit. Come to my fields. In my fields, we have pitchers of water set out, drink from it, feel at home. Like he kind of protects her in that way. Anyways, she goes home and she tells her mother-in-law about this. What did you call it? Prefer, pre preferential treatment that she's getting. And her mother-in-law 
says, oh, I forgot about him. That's our old relative, Boaz. He's a good guy. He's a really good guy. And um, they have a lot of gratitude to Boaz for helping. And he, he really shows tremendous kindness. Not that he ever, ever would have taken steps forward in like, you know, in hitting on her. I don't think that was his, that, that's not where his head was. He literally just does acts of kindness just because. And this is also something to think about because we are now, each one of us, writing our stories. And we don't know, like at the end of our storybook, at the end of our lives, people are going to be telling over our stories. And I think this man, Boaz, when he was just being kind to say, he had a connection to someone, here, let me help you out a little bit. Why should you, why should you like put yourself in, in danger's way? Let me help you a little bit. It didn't cost him anything. But we learn about Boaz and his kindness forevermore because of that. And it's just something like, we shouldn't be so protected of like, well, I don't want to give too much because, you know, like they might walk all over me. The things that we do for the people in our lives, that's our legacy. That, those are the stories that people are going to be talking about way past our lives, right? So we see that over here with Boaz. He does kindness. And, and it's something for us to think about. Like, how do we want to write our story? And how do we want people to remember what we did in our lives? So we talk about the concept of HP. HP, you guys are new, so I'm going to translate. But I think everyone here knows HP. It's, it's a Hebrew term, hashgacha pratit, which means divine intervention. For you guys to remember, or if you want to take notes, HP, think of higher power. Even though on Friday night at our dinner, one husband was like, I think it was Shari Sher's husband. She said, he's like, oh, I thought it stood for Highland Park. Because <laughs> my, my husband said at the dinner, guys, if you don't know what HP is by now, you haven't been listening to your wives. Because we talk about HP a lot and it's higher power. I think he was joking. I think he was joking. I hope he was joking. Okay. So, so there's a lot of HP over here. The fact that Boaz took notice of her, the fact that Ruth mentioned Boaz to Naomi, everything was, there was, God's hand was in this. And then a light bulb goes on in Naomi's mind and she devises a plan. And this plan is crazy. It's crazy. Like you would think, like Ruth would say, you know, mom, she's, she's like her mom right? Her, it's her mother-in-law, but they're literally like mother-daughter. You would think she would say, I've come along with you through some pretty hard stuff, pretty crazy things, but I'd come until here. Like, I'm not doing what you're asking of me right now. Because do you know what she asks of her? Do you know what her plan is? Okay, so this is, okay, so I'm not going to go so deeply into this idea. It's called Yibum, okay? Have you ever heard of the mitzvah of Yibum? Okay, I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell, but there's probably a lot more Okay, you've heard of it, but I, I, it's not something that is done today, generally. But I have not seen the video for Saturday night. This coming Saturday night, we're having a, a, a Saturday night cinema. You see the yellow flyer. We're having a, we're showing a movie over here, and then there's going to be a discussion afterwards. And it's a very similar story. And I, you have a similar story also, right? We've spoken about it. Laura. Yeah, about your family with with the marriages with your, well, no, I, okay, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Okay, let me explain what it is. I'm pretty sure it was you that mentioned. Okay, this, this is how it goes, okay? When a married man dies without having children and he has a brother, the brother has, who was it? Who was it? The brother has the responsibility or the opportunity to marry the widow. You guys following? Okay, first of all, that is what the Saturday Night's movie is about. It's a modern day Yibum story that doesn't happen very often. It does not happen very often. I did not see this video. I'm so excited to see it. Very, it's a beautiful movie, I, I've heard. Okay, and this is kind of a very beautiful observance. Okay, first of all, let me say it again. You're, no one is obligated, but there is this special mitzvah, this opportunity. If a man dies and leaves his widow without any children, if he has a brother that's able to marry his, um, his sister-in-law, then that is a special mitzvah called the Yibo. And basically what he... <laughs> 
It's happening to someone's family. Wait, who was it? Oh, it was Karen Miller. She was sitting right over there. I'm so sorry. Karen Miller, and she shared her story. Yes, this is exactly it. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So first of all, you and Karen are, are kind of remind me of her a little bit. She's hysterical. That's really, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's, let's just strand things out, Laura. Okay, but Karen Miller, who is such a dear friend of L'Chaim Center, she shared a couple of times her amazing story. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the details were that her mother passed away and her father married her. That's basically, that is basically, oh, no, I don't even know if they knew that this existed. It just worked out. No, it wasn't a religious thing at all. Okay, but let's just, let's, it, it was a beautiful story. It was a beautiful story. I mean, siblings are like, I mean, her cousins are like her siblings. They were even before they got married, like they were so close and it just made so much sense and it worked out beautifully. But let's just go back to this, this, uh, this story, okay? So, so if that would happen, if a woman would marry her brother-in-law, okay? The firstborn child to this couple would be considered as if it were the child of the deceased, you understand? So the deceased would have left his mark in the world through this child. That's what yibum means. Yibum, I'm not even sure what the technical translation is, but yibum is like to, I don't know what the word, it's like, I don't know. Can someone look up what yibum means? And it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female child. No, male no, child. yeah. Like you, you basically, you keep the memory of the deceased alive through his son. Okay, the son, it's, what, what did you say? Yeah, no, Leverite. It's a Leverite marriage. You guys thought things were complicated until now. Okay. This is, as Liz said, this is the most, the most complicated. It's a complicated relationship. And that's why, by the way, no one is obligated to do it. The person that has the opportunity to, to, to redeem, I think it's redeem. Yibam is to redeem. The person that has the opportunity to redeem by marrying this person has the choice. If he says no, which actually happens in this story, then it goes to the next person down the line. Okay, so uh, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, guys, I really think you should come on Saturday. If you're available to come Saturday night, it's, yeah, I know. So there's a, there's a conflict, I know. Okay, so, but whatever, if you're available, it's called fill the void fill the void and Gadi will be there to answer questions because there might be a lot of questions afterwards. So you'll have a discussion afterwards. And I think, and I, we're trying to get Rebetzin Twersky to Zoom with us afterwards because the story is about her her story. So so she lives in Milwaukee now, but we're, that, yeah, isn't that incredible? So you have to, okay. So let's go back to the story. Okay, this is a very, very mystical process, this Yibam, okay, of redeeming the brother's name but you're never required, okay? Any questions on this? Okay, and it always goes like next of kin, next of kin. So Naomi realizes that Boaz could actually be the redeemer of this family. Could you imagine the hope that she now feels once she makes all these connections? And this is all hashkacha pratit. Israel is a big place. They could have gone to any field. The fact that they went to Boaz's field, the fact that he was kind, the fact that she mentions him, the fact that she remembers, right? It's all like light bulbs going off. And then she says, I have a plan. And her plan is pretty crazy. And this is this is Ruth that has never heard of the laws of Ibum, has never heard of such a such a thing. And 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 this is this is her plan. Okay. So she says, Ruth, I want you to bathe yourself and put on perfume. And, and dress yourself up, okay? And then I want you to go to the threshing floor, like where everyone is like working, right? Threshing the wheat with all the young girls that are working the harvest. And I want you to wait there until Boaz falls asleep, okay? And then when he's fast asleep, I want you to go into his tent. I, I, I don't know if he was sleeping out there in the field. I, I don't know how it was, but you know, don't care about what anyone else might think or say, because clearly there was a lot of rumors and gossip in that time. Okay. I want you to go to him where he's sleeping, sit next to him. And I want you to cover 
his feet. I know. <laughs> Seriously, you can't take these things up. Like you can't. Like you can try. Uncover his feet, okay, and then lie down next to them, okay. Lie down next to his feet, and then she says her final line because she has this whole plan. And then I want you to wait for him to wake up and to tell you what to do next. Now go. Oh, no. Okay. I mean. Okay, so it's oi, like, like, oi, I'm telling you. So she, I mean, I, I would say, like most people would say, this is ridiculous. I'm not, first of all, her whole, we just spoke about her whole essence was so modest. She, she wouldn't even bend over to, to pick up the sheaves. She would bend down. I mean, she was like, I mean, she probably had really good thighs, like really good legs, like bending all, squatting all day in the, th in the, <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't know if it was like that. I mean, I think Naomi had intentions, uh, clearly, if she was going to be perfumed and looking her best and wearing her finest dress. I mean, sounds like she's trying to seduce him. I don't think Ruth even knows what she's doing. Okay, you want me to do what? No, I don't know if she was in that headspace. What? I don't know. Well, yeah, she was married for a couple years. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so just to, just to know, nothing nothing happened that night. She does go to the field. This 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 plan carries out, but she doesn't lie with him, right? She lies by his feet, and she doesn't know what was what would happen. So so this is this is what happened. So Boaz he starts he startles in the night, and it's in the middle of the night, which is kind of good because he has to think very quickly before everyone comes to to work in the morning he doesn't want this to be the gossip of the town so he startles he sees this lovely girl by his feet and he says who are you and ruth identifies herself and she asks him i mean talk about a pickup line she asks him to spread his robe over her as if as he was as he were as he were a redeemer she basically puts that down there she puts it down that by him, he's, she says, could you, could you cover me with your robe? Because you could be my redeemer. Okay, this is the first time, you know, she's being told what to say by her mother-in-law. She puts it down and a light bulb goes off in Boaz's head because he also didn't make the connection that his, the whole lineage of his family ended. And there's no one else who's going to marry these women who are they, you know, right? If, yeah, <laughs> if it's not me, then, then who? So, so he understood, he kind of had a aha moment. He's a, a person that understood the laws of, of Torah and he understood her meaning. And he sits, he sits up and he kind of realizes that he has this, uh, this opportunity to fulfill this obligation of Yibam. But he also realizes that there are people that come before him that should have the opportunity. So he's not going to jump on this. I mean, first of all, did I mention that he's an old man? Did I mention that? Oh, he's, a, he's an old man. In fact, he doesn't live much longer wedding night. Okay? Yeah, yeah. No, she didn't kill him. But, but he doesn't live. I don't think he lives on very long. But, 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 it, but their union has ramif good ramifications for forevermore. So he basically says, I'm gonna do my due diligence. I wanna do things right. So first I'm gonna to go to the next in pin. I'm gonna see if they wanna redeem you. And if they don't, I promise you I will. Okay, so he basically gives her his word and he gives her when he says like, go home before all the people come. You know, he doesn't want any, no hanky panky. No, he doesn't want any rumors flying. Go home. It's the middle of the night. There is an institution over there. She's very vulnerable. Didn't take up, didn't, you know, use the opportunity for anything. But he sends her home with a gift of six measures of barley. Now, our sages and our sources and our commentaries speak about this being a hint to the six leaders that were going to come from her in her life. There were many leaders to come. Um, it, it also gives hints to the six outstanding attributes 
that are represented by her offspring, which is going to be King David, right? And those six ones are, I mean, he was skillful in playing. He was a man of valor. He was a man of war. He was prudent in affairs. He was handsome in appearance and God was with him. Those are the six things that we know about King David. And I also like to think of like the star of David, but the six points, right? That's something like, like basically his giving her the six represented so much of what was to come. It was almost like this burst of inspiration or prophecy that he brought it home. She brought it home to Naomi and, and they sit and they wait. And he goes and he says, he does whatever he's supposed to do, which is going to the next of kin and um, in front of eyewitnesses, the next of kin, you know, he's thinking maybe I should be the redeemer, but then, but it, he doesn't want to marry Ruth. I mean, his loss. So, so he basically removes his shoe. Did I mention the shoe? No. So the shoe is part of Yibam, okay? That if someone does not want to, to be the redeemer, like if you're given this opportunity, this is biblically, you know, back in the day, I don't think it's like this nowadays, but part of Yibam, look this up, is the taking off of the shoe. And actually, I think it's spitting in the shoe. Yeah. Yeah. There is something, Liz, you, like, maybe look it up. I, I, ask about it but anyway so he he takes off his shoe in front of the eyewitnesses to declare that he is not going to be the redeemer and why is it the shoe anyone know why why it would be the shoe um <laughs> okay so removing his shoe i mean it does have to do with her sitting by the feet that was her message to say you could redeem me it has to do with the shoe it signifies giving up his obligation and his rights by him taking off the shoe, I don't know, that was the symbol. That was the, the secret handshake. Takes off your shoe, that means I'm giving up his rights. And um, yeah, so so Ruth and, Mar and Boaz get married. Mazel Tov, straight away they have a child. His name is Oved, which means servant. And, um, and what's so, so beautiful about this story is that, you know who raises this child? The Bubby. Um, Naomi. Naomi raises the child as her own. And and it's really cute. Her friends, because, you know, when she came back and she was like, oh, what a sad story. Look at Naomi. She looks terrible. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you find? Well, this is if, if the dead man's brother does not wish to marry the widow or she does not want to marry him, a standard divorce is insufficient to sever their bond. Instead, they perform a procedure known as Alitsa, which means removal. In this case, the removal of the brother-in-law's shoe. Only after a ceremony has been completed is the widow free to marry someone else many scholars suggest reasons for the strange practice some say brother-in-law's shoe is removed in order to humiliate him for not fulfilling the mitzvah of Yibu. still others suggest that the removal of his shoe serves to symbolize that he has no claim to his brother's inheritance huh. okay oh, okay no. so yeah this I, I this is not something that i'm very well versed in like the laws of Yibu and, and chalitza those are the two mitzvah there's two of the 613 as I said, we can't do them all. Like, I don't think anyone in this room has had the opportunity to do Yibam or Chalitza. Chances are your husband's also not, right? It's so rare. And it's even back in the day, it was so, so rare. Okay. Similar to a sandal with a thick heeled sole and long rubber straps, the Beth Din keeps this unique shoe specifically used during the Chalitza ceremony. The mother puts it on his right foot, wrapping and tying the straps. Wow. Around wow. his leg in a specified way. Huh. Okay. It, it's very interesting. Maybe, maybe if when we see this movie, there'll be some talk about it in the movie. Um, but but what I love about the story also, like how things like switch, things turn. First she's scorned and made fun of by her friends. And then her friends come to her and they say, Naomi, you know, your daughter-in-law is better to you than seven sons. Like it's just such a there's there is such a beautiful switch over from from her being really downtrodden to being really, really respected. And now she has this joy of raising her, her grandson. It's just, it's so beautiful. Like this mother-daughter relation, mother-daughter-in-law relationships. Um, just amazing. So we only have a few more minutes and I just want to get to the end of the story. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to note that Okay, this is this is probably important to to put in here. Okay, let me let me just go with about Mashiach coming from this union. 
of Boaz and Ruth. That it's important to note that the Messiah, that you know, we don't really understand what that means, but our savior, so, someone that's gonna help the Jewish people is not gonna be some guy from with a perfect background, perfect lineage, no skeletons in the closet, right? He's not gonna fit into any box we can imagine he should fit into. He's gonna have, he's gonna come from roots that are all over the map. There's gonna be ancestors that were not good. There's gonna be ancestors that are good, right? This is so beautiful and so important. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It matters where you're going, okay? So important to know that part of the lineage of Mashiach is the story of where Ruth comes from. Her father's side of the family, her father was a very cruel man. He was the King Eglon. If anyone has heard of Eglon, this, he's known to be this enormously obese um, taskmaster, right? Um, King Eglon. And, and there's one saving grace. You know how the wicked, wicked Asav had one good trait to him, one mitzvah that he observed. We spoke about this. Does anyone remember what it was? Good, good. Asav, the wicked Asav, he murdered, he raped, he stole. He was a bad guy. But one mitzvah that he did really well was honoring his father. Okay. And because of that, his head was actually buried. It rolled in and it was buried in the cave of the patriarchs, Marat Mafela. Okay, just his head. Okay, the rest of him didn't merit to get it. He did terrible things with his with the rest of his body, but he spoke kindly to his parents, this and that. So over here, this cruel king, the father of Ruth, also terrible, terrible guy. He's done so much, lots of water under that bridge, but there was one redeeming moment in his life. And for that, he merits to have part of this, I mean, the lineage is coming not only from Ruth, but from him, right? So his one redeeming trait that he did, one thing that he did. So a Jew came to assassinate him, saying that he had a message from God for him. King Eglon, who, who the Jews were, and though he was causing them to suffer, right, there was not a good relationship between Eglon and the Jews. When the Jew walked in, Eglon exerted great effort to stand in honor of the message, the message from God of the Jews, right? There, he gave some respect to that moment in time with this Jew that had come to him. And with all his despicable deeds, this one act of reverence earned him the honor of having the Mashiach in his lineage. So he redeemed himself in this one, in this one act, and his daughter is Ruth, and she becomes the foremother of the, of the Messiah. Okay, when do we read the story? Shavuos, okay, on Shavuos, we read the story of Ruth, Megillus, Rus, and which is really Shavuos is when we get the Torah, so it's kind of the birth of the Jewish people in a way, and why we read it, all of us read it, is because on Shavuot, we're supposed to see ourselves like we're all converts, like we're all choosing in. In Shavuot, when we get the Torah, it's not like, oh, thousands of years ago, we all stood around Mount Sinai and we said, Nas Evan Ishmael, we're going to do, we're going to listen afterwards, we're all in. Every single year, every single time, every, every opportunity, I feel like it's every single day is a choice. Every day, there's choice in front of you. Actually, um, commercial break for tonight, we're having a talk at 7.30 with Laura Martyr, and she's talking about free will, right? Do we have free will? Bichira right? I, I hope everyone comes back tonight. Yes, for a great talk with Laura Martyr. So really, it's all choice, right? We see the choices that, that Ruth made that had everlasting effects, right? Our, our ancestors, even the ones that left Egypt, they all had choice, right? We know that only one-fifth of the Jewish people left Egypt. Many did not, right? Many were like, uh, they, they, they choose, you know, for you to be here, I always say this, for you to be a Jew today, it means for a for hundred generations, people chose in, but some people did not choose in. Some people chose out, right? So we see this, this gift of choice. That's why we all read it to inspire ourselves with the story of someone that chose in and went through those hoops of fire, so to speak. Okay. So just it's just one step forward and then another one and then another one. There was definitely a lot of discomfort in their story. There was a lot of humiliation and poverty. And um, it made them into what they became. Their, their 
story really unfolded. Okay, and I, I see some people need to go. It's 12 o'clock. Um, there's a little bit more of the story that I'd love to share. I'm just, um, you know, I, I've i shared this before. My mentor, Aliza Bulo, she, she talks about having an Amuna continuum. Okay, do you guys remember this? It's, it's so good to memorize this because it's, it's, it's good to tell yourself again and again. So everyone falls along the continuum somewhere, okay? Whether you know it or not. So some people, even, even people that let's say, say, I don't believe, right? They still, I think every human being should hopefully have some hope for something bigger, for a higher power, right? Even if you don't call it God, you could say, I don't believe in God, but there's, there are no atheists in a foxhole, meaning in a pinch, you feel like there has to be something that could help you. Someone, some, some, it can't just stop with you. There has to be someone. So um, Elisa says there's this continuum, a faith continuum that is a God, whatever you want to call it. He runs the world. He runs my world. And the highest level is he runs my world for the good. Mm -hmm. And she says that people throughout their journeys sometimes wax and wane in how they feel. Like sometimes you feel like, oh my gosh, that was just for me. That happened. God made this happen just for me. Sometimes it's so clear that God runs our world for the good. But sometimes we're in so much pain and whatever the situation is that we can't possibly say that that's for the good. And maybe we don't even believe that it's that God is running my world. So, so we have to find ourselves on this continuum somewhere and it changes over time. It changes in our level of uh, dedication, devotion, whatever it is. So there is a God, he runs my world. He runs my, um, there is a God, he runs the world. He runs my world, he runs my world for the good. So in this story, we see a lot of the hands of God, okay? Throughout the whole thing, these women were strong in their faith. They know that there was a Hashem. They know that there could be a change. They know that things could turn for the best, but it really, really came full circle how it went from, from such a bleak situation to um, a very amazing situation. And um, I'm just gonna end, I'm just gonna end with that. I'm gonna, I, I, want, to, I want to just end with a, something that I spoke about last night at the Rosh Chodesh events. Many of you were there, but I'll just touch upon one thing for us to think about as we go into this month with Tu Bishvat. It's passion, okay? So passion, passion, okay? Because clearly there had to be a fire in Ruth's heart to get through all the hardship. There was something that, that helped keep her going through all these dark years of losing her husband, of, of being so just relying on other people. And, and she was she basically committed herself to an older woman and that was her life. I mean, it could have been a very depressing situation but I think she never gave up on her hope. So there was a passion in her heart for her values, for doing what's right. And last night in our Tu Bishvat event, we spoke about the different elements that build a tree. The different elements, if anyone was there, what did we say? There's the water, there's the fire, soil, and roots. Oh, air, air, the roots are the soil, right? The air is the spirituality. The water is being connected to each one. And then the last one was the fire. So I just want to talk about that because that's something that I really like thinking about. And I really, I love like, I love it when people start dreaming again. Sometimes the dreams that we have kind of get like shelved into a corner or just put, put like put away. And throughout our lives, like we should probably like dust off those dreams and remind ourselves what we believe in what our passions are. I wrote in, in one of my recent Facebook posts, I wrote, um, I, if anyone saw the, the picture of the Magen David, it was like I was driving down the street and I saw this beautiful shul. And um, I, I have no idea. I don't even know where I was, but it doesn't matter. But, but what I wrote, I, I quoted Rabbi Noah Weinberg. He said, he famously said, what, what would you be willing to die for? Just kind of like a drastic question to ask. I mean, he was in the 80s when he asked this question. It's not like no one's dying for their Judaism. But he said, if you know what you're willing to, if you know what you'd be willing to die for, then you know what. And it's the sacrifice, like to be willing to give something up for a higher value, then you're living for your values. 
So this is, I'm just gonna end with that. Lots to think about in our own lives, how we could possibly put our values there and dust it off, a dream, a passion, the fire in our hearts for something that's bigger than us that we'd be willing to sacrifice for. Cause that's what we see in the story of Ruth. She gave up a lot, but it was worth it. So with that, if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to stay, Julie. Oh, good. Yeah. Wait for what? Oh, are there any comments or questions? Any questions? I did not get through the whole story. I had to skip around a little bit, but isn't it like a fascinating story? I mean, these, this is, this is the Jewish people. Absolutely. Very passionate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.